Okay. Okay. Hello, hi everyone. Thank you for coming um, to the SEC meeting today. Uh, please mute yourself um, and then uh, put in your questions throughout the, um, the meeting um, in the chat and um, we will uh, try to answer them afterwards. Um, today, we are very fortunate to have Teresa with us here. Um, Teresa works with WSP. She has been with the company for more than three decades, to be exact, <laughs> 33 years. Um, we are um, we're very happy to have her. Um, Teresa um, is um, it's a structural engineer, a project manager. Um, she has been successfully leading projects of all types to achieve their sustainability and re resiliency um, goals. Um, and we're very happy um, to have her present with us today. Um, we're gonna um, pass the time out to her. Um, thank you, Teresa, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Esther. I'm glad to be here. Um, my presentation is called Developing a Pathway to Sustainability. And this is a really broad subject. So it was kind of hard to narrow it down to just a few topics. Okay. This is the overall um, agenda for the meeting. Uh, we'll start with the introduction. We'll go through talking about finding the right sustainability and resiliency for a particular project and clients. We'll talk about project requirements and their ever-changing project requirements. We'll talk about construction and then sustainability plans. So these are the learning object objectives for this, for today. Um, and I probably will talk more about number four, the sustainability plan, but it's very important. Number three, the um, how do we uh, convey this information and these requirements to the contractor? That has been a stumbling block if we look back on our history here um, in the design world. And not just for sustainability, but um, for other things as well. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the changes in the funding sources and different requirements that are coming across our desks now. Um, and, and we will start off with um, looking at sustainability systems. So just to get on the same page, there's a lot of different discussions out there as to what sustainability means, what resiliency means. These are two definitions that we use here at WSP. So we're including um, considering the environment and working towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions in our sustainability work, regardless of whether there's a separate resiliency plan. And this is a, a decision that um, we feel meets our clients' needs as well as that of the planet. Uh, there's a lot of changes around that, and um, you could talk, you could spend hours just on the one subject of net zero and greenhouse gas emissions. I'm um, including resiliency, though I will a lot of times refer just to sustainability out of habit. Um, in the past, resilience was its own a report, and that resiliency report informed the design and the sustainability design, but more and more we're combining the two into one uh, specific report or plan. So it's, um, it's, it's your choice how to go forward, but I just wanted to clarify those. These are the definitions that I'm going to refer to. <clears throat> so number one, sustainability and resiliency. We start first with the clients' goals. And the clients, um, they're, they're throwing everything into the project with, you know, I used to refer to this as throwing everything in, in the, including the kitchen sink. Um, and they, 
they need to they need help in determining what is right for their situation and what is right for the project. Um, traditionally, we have always had recycling uh, and air quality and water conservation and energy conservation as part of the sustainability field. Now, even within an urban environment, we're expanding to stewardship, um, urban forestry, um, and, and more. This, the field is expanding as we speak, and there's something in it for everybody. So if you have an interest in something, then pursue that interest because there is a need for it somewhere. Oftentimes we will start with the client's guidelines and standards. Um, the client may have uh, interest in having a lead gold project, uh, but for every project out there, every project type that comes across my desk these days, there is a particular rating system for that project. I highlighted Envision and Lead at the top because those are the two that we most use. We are also using ParkSmart quite a bit. Um, some of our clients use the airport carbon accreditation and many of our clients have their own standards and guidelines. So Envision is for unoccupied spaces outside the building envelope. For example, if you have a campus situation that includes a parking area, a road, um, other facilities, then you might have Envision for those. For the building side, we would, um, the building side, we refer to that as occupied space. But this is a complicated issue because when we have a parking garage such as in the lower corner here, that could fall under ParkSmart. Uh, it could be um, in association with Envision. Um, in the past, we've included them in lead projects, uh, though then lead pushed it out and now lead welcomes it back with ParkSmart. So it's a changing, evolving world. For airport facilities, oftentimes we'll have uh, part of the facility Envision and part of it lead. Bleed may cover the terminal building and other occupied spaces, but there are a lot of facilities out there that are part of the campus that are unoccupied. So an electric substation may be designed with a pathway to lead, but is, is lead really the right fit for it? So it helps with some of the material design, some of the siting, some of the energy savings, but it's unoccupied space. So perhaps it's a hybrid of both Envision and LEED. All of these things we need to think about. You know, the client may have one uh, rating system that's mandatory. And if we show them what's out there, uh, we can better fit um, the project to what the client's needs are. I have buses down here. We have a bus project right now. Uh, that is using both Envision and LEED. The building itself is, is following a pathway to LEED and the site as a whole is following an Envision pathway. So there are synergies that go along with that. Um, but in talking about finding the right pathway for the client and the project, we are now also not only looking at what's been done before, but we're looking into the future. Where do we go from here? It, a lot of times we're working on infrastructure projects that have a lifespan of 75 to 100 years. Here in Boston, we've all seen and, and we know bridges that are over 100 years. We have um, projects that are going to see loads and events in the lifespan of that project that they've never encountered before. Design projects, design codes are based on data from the past, from past events that they could uh, note down the number of storms and the temperatures and whatnot. Right fitting a project in a client needs to consider the future and what, uh, what activities will occur through that life of the project and um, 
and where we're going from here. That's a very hard one to consider, but exciting at the same time. I wanted to briefly mention funding requirements because in the past six months, we have seen RFPs and RFQs with language in it that we have never had to deal with before, never saw. There was a manufacturing facility that number one deliverable they were asking for was an environmental um, stewardship sustainability program. It's pretty exciting. What does it mean? <laughs> Um, and it may mean one thing to the owner and one thing to some, someone else. So there's a lot of communication that has to take place. Um, but it's, it's very important to make sure that your system, your project aligns with what the project is looking for. And with the sustainability uh, rating systems, with the sustainability plans, you can incorporate all of these extra objectives and um, focus points on in those projects. You can add that into your program, all right? So we're gonna show you a couple things. Um, this is just from Envision and LEAD, but there are, are many more examples out there. The point I wanted to make is that you can use the sustainability rating system to help you define all of these to bring into alignment the project with the uh, sub, with the requirements, even though they're typically you might think of it as typically outside of a structural design or an engineering design or even um, your architectural work. But bringing it all together is is very important. So uh, you can get the extra credit from taking that information from the um, what the requirement is and and get credit for it within your um, rating system. Is that your form? It is very important to embed sustainable requirements through your construction documents. And people are always asking, how do we do this? Um, first of all, we have the specifications. We, we have the technical specifications where we require a certain percentage of recycled content. Um, we, we require materials, paints, solvents, um, all, caulking, all of those things with low VOCs. And it is, it is not enough simply to uh, look at just the in envelope, the building envelope, or the waterproofing envelope. Our projects are broader than that now. We have to consider all of the materials used on the project. And we have to review those, um, those materials with standards for VOCs, for uh, recycled content, for where it's coming from. So our specifications uh, are a place where we can put information. And it may get very detailed, um, but that's what specifications are all about. So we don't use that as a reason not to do something. We get more detailed, we get more specific. And the more specific we are, the easier it is for the contractor to understand what we're talking about. Uh, the construction waste management plans touch not only the construction of the building and the demolition of the building, but also the means and methods of the contractor. We have, um, th this has always been the case when we were looking at how a contractor manages his space, how they go about um, cleaning up uh, daily debris and waste products, um, but it's all part of the sustainability system. Um, we're requiring the contractor to uh, provide us with information of how they will go about their means and methods. Uh, what kind of uh, equipment are they going to use? Are they going to use green equipment? Green, <laughs> if you look that up, you might find Tonka trucks that are green. That's not what we mean. We mean equipment that's not 50 years old and spewing lots of 
uh, greenhouse gases and emissions, we want to see, um, we want the contractor to consider uh, the environmental impact of their construction on the project. We want them to consider the trucking routes that they use, not just for uh, congestion, but also is it the most efficient on a large project, this particular um, project in the background, you could have a crushing operation there on site. So if you're doing demolition work, you can have at one part of the project, a crushing operation that's taking that concrete and making uh, recycled um, aggregate out of it. And it could be a facility that is used by multiple projects occurring at the same time. So that information needs to be conveyed to the contractor in some way, form. Uh, oftentimes, it, um, it's driven by the needs of a particular client. The construction drawings, we always start with the general notes. And I know that we are all dealing with um, standard details for things. It's time to start rethinking standard details and be able to work with those within the sustainability field. Uh, I know a lot of times we are asking a, con uh, a client to consider performance standards and other things, other measures and metrics besides their typical details. And that's a very hard nut to crack. And I agree that there are a lot of standard details that are absolutely fine and work. I'm just asking that we explore and allow ourselves to grow. It's not a static thing. Um, other things that are included in conveying the information is the policies within uh, a contract, uh, within a client's modes of operation, how they are functioning. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more with the sustainability plan. Okay. The policies uh, here in Massachusetts, we have, uh, uh, we have the state making changes to their the state projects, the MassDOT. Um, and those are new requirements that we're going to have to meet. And that, and they're hoping that that'll spread out and apply to other pro projects and become the new norm. Sustainability plans, now uh, also called sustainability res resiliency management plans. These are, um, these are documents that span the life of the project from the conceptual phase all the way through to operation and maintenance. And um, you can, you should start them as soon as, as early as possible in the, in the process. And I've listed a few things that we include within these plans. The achievement goals is referring to what the client um, looking for, whether it's lead gold, envision gold, what, um, where are their, what achievement are they looking to have for their project. But the sustainability plan also needs to provide the pathway to get there. And um, that pathway may take a lot of turns and twists and whatnot. Um, it needs to describe the project and not only the project but also the uses of the project, how the, the, that project will work within the community that it's set in. It'll describe the construction practices, whether it's a design build project, whether it is a design bid build. There are advantages and disadvantages with both of them. Um, and it, it's just explaining within the document how it's going to be constructed. There's no right or wrong. The sustainability metrics are the rating systems. So the sustainability plan is the overarching plan that talks about how this project is going to be sustainable. And the, the rating system measures how it, it has achieved that level of sustainability. And the pathway to that sustainability is varied. When we talk about Envision, there's 64 credits in Envision, but 
there's four to five levels of achievement within each credit. So there are, there are many, many pathways to that Envision Gold. And finding the right pathway for the client is very important. And outlining that pathway in the sustainability plan helps for the communication for the entire team, for the contractor, for, all, for everyone that is in, involved in this particular project. Okay, let's go on. Just a word about boundaries. So the sustainability plan is going to list the boundaries of a project and um, it's going to list the boundaries of a particular uh, rating system. In this case, um, this is showing three. There's one in green that's different um, around the garage. <clears throat> and everything within that boundary system is going to be tracked by the contractor for the particular rating system. However, we need to consider that the sustainability is not limited to that line, that the sustainability needs to include um, how the construction vehicles get to the construction site, the path they take, what they impact, um, the neighbors, <clears throat> the hauling routes, excuse me. All of these things are very important to determining your boundary and your consideration for your sustainability. Um, the, the sustainability systems really encourage you to look at the whole community. Okay, talking about our pathway, we're gonna start with the preliminary design, the conceptual phase. And <clears throat> um, generally the contractors, uh, the client starts with their goals and their objectives but uh, you need to start to look at what the overarching goals are and the specific goals. So the overarching goals may be that we want to be uh, a better neighbor in the community. For example, if an airport um, has an overarching goal that they want to improve customer service or passenger experience, uh, they want to be a good neighbor to the residents that are um, just across the street from where they are. And then the goals for the project would be uh, a reduction in, the, in energy for the project um, use. For example, if they're looking at, say, a 10% reduction in energy, um, that's over the life of the project. Or do they want to step it up? Do they want to start at one benchmark and say that, as they're moving through the, the work on this particular facility, they're going to be able to improve that benchmark as they go along. So it's not just a moment in time that is held for 75 years. No, it's a pathway to where they're going. So um, they can, the client can help write that pathway and see that, the, that they could incrementally improve as they're going along. And it's really good if it's possible in the preliminary design to identify all roadblocks to sustainability. And some of these things don't come to surface until opening day of a project, and that's understandable. But if, if, um, if at all possible, the sustainability team can look into these roadblocks and identify them ahead of time and then mitigate them um, long before you reach the construction phase. It'll make the whole process so much easier. But the sustainability plan can address roadblocks as you're going along as well. For example, um, if you're if there's a policy in place that requires a certain type of, of material from a certain vendor. Now that never happens, but I'm just saying that um, if that product is no longer available, is that a roadblock? We've seen a lot of roadblocks over the past year with this pandemic where 
uh, manufacturers could not get all of the parts that they needed because of the pandemic and all that was well that's a roadblock <clears throat> that roadblock can be mitigated by replacing that product with something else and we've seen that occur over the past nine months um, some roadblocks there's another roadblock that required a a contract to every single separate contract to have a sustainability plan. Well, on one particular project, we were doing a, a campus-wide project. The client actually had to go back and change their policy so that all the facilities would fit in one sustainability plan because they had, a, they had to physically do the work of changing a policy. But that helped, in the end, that helped um, smooth the construction along. The design, um, the sustainability plan was applied unilaterally to all the projects and it was broad enough to fit all of the projects. It simplified the design and helped with the construction. So <clears throat> collaboration, starting first and foremost in the preliminary designs, establishing a communication path from the design team to the owner, to managers, whatever pathway it happens to be, um, having a kickoff meeting and a charrette with all parties. And that means all parties, means the design team. If there's a contractor on board with a design build project, the contractor's invited and the contractor comes. And the client and the client stakeholders and any, any person that is touched by the project is involved in the kickoff meeting. Also within the sustainability plan, you need to have a timeline, you need to have a schedule of deliverables. You need to understand where the deliverables for the sustainability fall within the deliverables uh, schedule for the contract documents or the specifications. You need to have um, an understanding of when you're going for verification. <clears throat> okay, during the design phase, uh, again, you want to be able to talk to all parts of the design team, all members of the design team, whether they're subs or um, stakeholders or, uh, or if something's being reviewed by an outside party, everybody needs to um, be able to communicate with one another in a manner that is uh, helps their design, okay? So in the design, we have the most work, the, the longest period of time. <clears throat> and it's also um, the most important area of the sustainability design phase. We're going to create a, the pathway um, to meeting the sustainability requirements and the resiliency requirements. And we need to know when all of these pieces fit together. So the schedule of submissions is very important. If you're working on a, a project with resiliency, the resiliency needs to be done as early in the project as possible so that it can inform the design team on everything that they know, on everything that will impact the design team. If there's wind loads or storms or flooding that's going to impact the design, then that really needs to, there needs to be a pathway from that resiliency information back to the design team. At the same time, the design team is designing all of the pieces of that project. So you'll have HVAC equipment, you'll have equipment for, um, for operation of the facility, whatever it happens to be. All of those pieces of equipment, if that is impacted by a particular storm event, either an earthquake or a wildfire or a flood or um, excessive wind loads, then those pieces of equipment need to be assessed by the resiliency team and see the impacts of them. And they need to work together. So you have the impact um, from the climate on the project. And then you have the 
how the project will function. So if, if certain uh, critical assets of that facility need to be moved, it needs to happen, it needs to occur during the design phase. If something can be lived, if, a, if an event comes in and it knocks out a particular signpost and that is not relevant to the present moment, the project can wait until it comes back, and then that's not considered critical. Critical are things that they need in order to operate um, at full capacity. <clears throat> So those items need to be coordinated. It's a big chunk of work. And it's very exciting, the things that are happening now. We're moving things up out of the flood area in our neighborhood here in the Boston area. We're rethinking where entrances are to buildings, where, where windows are, where energy um, comes from, whether they're we're going to try to produce our own energy on site, or if we're going to consider doing a microgrid instead of um, connecting in with the, the full um, regular grid, national grid. Or... So there's a lot of work that happens here. And when we come out the other side of this, um, we're going to provide a sustainability plan for the construction phase to follow. So we have to take everything that we have done up to now and continue that in the construction phase. So we need to continue the collaboration, the coordination. We need to continue with um, working together as a team and um, the lines of communication. The construction goals, um, there's overarching construction goals as well, save water, save energy, fuel efficiency. We are talking also about the construction methods, which I mentioned earlier, and the, and the logistics of hauling things. Where is it going through? Is there lay down area on a place that's going to kill the grass? Are they going to, re, are they going to save the topsoil and be able to put the topsoil back? Um, there are so many details that only a contractor can see. Uh, a contractor can mention you're, you're using a product that comes from 600 miles away, but there's, an, there's the same pro product available within 100 miles. They have that information. We are fortunate right now that so many manufacturers have uh, started doing EPDs and all of the documentation that the different sustainable systems require. So that helps make things easier. But a contractor still needs to track all of the materials. And I think uh, we've seen a lot of the bigger companies, the bigger construction companies, they have their own sustainability team within their company that jumps on board and um, knows exactly what all this means. For some of the other contractors, they're on the Learn As You Go program, like we all are. So there are some clients that say, we want you to give the client, contractor everything that they need to do their job. And um, so we can, we can provide the contractor with spreadsheets, with tracking sheets, LEED has a lot of examples of that. <clears throat> they have a, a lot of contracts that they require, <coughs> excuse me. And, and the, um, we work together with the contractor. So going back to that collaboration, the contractor has information that they can share with us, with the sustainability and the design team so that we can all work together on this. I have an example of that coming up. This is an older picture, actually, of the LaGuardia Airport. I say that because the terminal is uh, achieving a, a LEED um, a, a certification to, I think, LEED Gold. Uh, and the Envision Platinum Award is on the entire LaGuardia Airport for the terminal redevelopment project, which is both the air side and 
the land side. Um, so in this project, this project was very interesting, not just because of the number of different project types that there were, but it was interesting that it was a design build contractor and the design build contractor had a vested interest in the sustainability as well. They were passionate about it. So, you know, we brought up this whole tracking of materials issue and we, we didn't think it was an issue. We, we thought you just have to track how much recycled content, where the materials are coming from. You have to track the VOCs. And the contractor, the design build contractor said, well, the way we are building this project is that we are building different pieces of it at different times because of the schedule. This is an operational airport. This operation, this, the, the function of the airport will continue through the construction. So because of that, what do we do? We need to build this first and then demo that. We need to demo this in order to build that. We need to build something temporary and then build something else. The complexity there was very fascinating. But, I, but they brought up these different contracts and they said, how can we simplify this? Because what we do is we purchase pipe, for example, um, a storm, uh, stormwater system was going from contract to contract to contract. And the design build contractor buys the whole length of the, of the service in order to save money. Makes sense, right? But because of the tracking, here we are, we're looking at each individual piece as a separate entity of the tracking. The contractor said, look, we'll track all of it together. We'll track all of the parts and have one master Envision project that's gonna go over all of the individual contracts. And, and that was a terrific solution. So there's one Envision project for this whole LaGuardia Airport. The work on that started back in 2016 and we're at 2021 now. They're expected to be completely finished uh, the beginning of next year, 2022. I think they they did work through um, most of the pandemic, but it's it slowed them down a little bit. But it's been a phenomenal job. And when you work together with the contractor, um, they will bring up things that that uh, we weren't aware of, um, and they can they can infuse. Um, sustainability in their work as well as impacting the design in a positive way. And that's, a, that's something that if we all listen to each other and collaborate together, it can make for an easier process. What we did on this project for collaboration was we had a, a high level sustainability team that include the client representatives, the contractor, the operation and maintenance um, team, the concessionaire, and the design team, both um, the architectural design team and the infrastructure design team. And we would meet at least quarterly. Then with stepping down from that, we had our own design team uh, meetings with the, the design and construction meetings with the design build contractor. And then stepping down from that, we had meetings with the separate design teams and with the design teams that were working together on various projects. So there is a, um, a connection from, from one point to another. And we had a communication plan of how, how to convey information along that line so that we could all talk to each other and speak the same language. We all had one sustainability plan to follow which did take a long time in the, in the beginning to put together, but it was well worth it when you think about the number of years the project has, has been going on. All right, so we are, we are at 12.53. Um, I, had, I had just uh, 
more thoughts about future design. And um, but we can open it up for questions for 15 minutes of questions, if there are questions. Hi, everybody, and Teresa, that's fantastic. Um, can you squeeze in the rest of your thoughts, um, or would you prefer to have questions? Uh, I can do both. Um, we are so, we're scheduled to to go until one thirty. Oh, oh, okay, so okay. I'll keep going. <laughs> it, it depends on you. I was thinking it was an hour. All right. Well, um, I wanted to, the the piece the the next piece after this is the um, future ready, which is called many different things. We have. This is going back to what I talked about earlier, where we're thinking about the life of the project. When we're looking at an infrastructure project that is lasting 75 to 100 years, we're looking at how that project uh, is going to operate through that time period. What events is it going to see? Um, you know, rating systems come back and they re, um, they recertify projects. Well, we can, as a design team, reevaluate the impacts, the environmental impacts on a project as we're going through as well. We talk about having um, maintenance and manufacturing um, updates on things. We talk about having uh, regular um, inspections of parking facilities where we go through and we give a structural analysis in a certain span of years. We can also do that for the climate side of things. How often are, uh, is our climate changing? Um, we have one contract where every two years we'll reevaluate that. And then every 10 years we'll reevaluate it on a bigger scale. So we're, we're designing if we have that process in place to uh, design for the changing climate of the future, then what we're doing is we're designing for a 10 year increment. So we have what that facility will see within 10 years with an idea of where we're going down the line to the end. But it helps the client to be able to update their standards. It helps them to to create a project and a timeline for um, when they will do different parts of the facility and different parts of, of the work. So if we have existing buildings that are directly impacted by say stormwater, um, and we have, we have an update for different materials in that building, we're going to update the windows or the doors for certain pressure of of storm surge and certain certain um, events, we can do we can decide when that is going to occur. So we can design for that now. We could design for for raising one one question is always are we going to raise a particular road or a particular path or change a path to go around an area that we're going to let to allow to flood? We can step back and allow that. To, to take place at a different point of the timeline. Um, another project, another thing is looking at the environment, the tree cover, um, the systems within the city of Boston, for example. We do have a lot of green space. We also have a lot of brick and places. Um, we have, we have, uh, clients that are moving towards electric vehicles. They don't want to do it all at once. We want to do it in a certain space at a certain time. So that having that timeline allows us to look at this particular um, needs of the client and the needs of the community and expand our sustainability plan to fit all of those elements into it. 
And that sounds like a big task, but the framework of the sustainability plan allows us to do that. We have the framework that takes us, um, that shows us where we have our, our, our changes in our society and our um, roadblocks. I like the word roadblocks, and that's probably because I myself am an engineer. <clears throat> Um, so a client needs to go through and look at things. I don't want to use that one. Let me go on. <laughs> uh, um, we need to look at our future environment and see uh, where we need to, to make changes in the future as we're working with our clients. And our clients have all of these goals. They're already thinking about this. And um, to incorporate this into the plan itself means that our overarching goals expand across the timeline. So our overarching goals become, uh, we wanna be a good neighbor. We want to improve the passenger experience. And then stepping back from that, how do we do that? Well, we, we can add a buffer zone on the edge of this facility for a, particular, um, for a particular neighborhood. It could be that we're expanding um, the green space within the city of Boston. It could be that, you know, that there are many things, but it all comes from working together between the, the client, the owner, and I'm, the client is not always the owner of the facility. Um, the neighbors, the stakeholders, and the stakeholders aren't always the neighbors. They're also those that operate and maintain the space. So we have we have our own um, direction to help them, and and we need to listen first to what the needs of the stakeholders and the clients are. And to listen to what they are, um, if we talk first, what happens is we put an idea in their head. If they first tell us how they feel about something, then we're trying to interpret that into a uh, metric that we can work with. So the wonderful thing about the sustainability plans is it gives us these metrics to measure our, our things. But we need to take what the stakeholder is providing us and be able to help them reach the goals that the client has. So that accountability, working back and forth between them, understanding this timeline. Now, the, um, the projects that we have in Boston are mostly impacted by the storm surge, by the climate, um, the heat climate, by the rain, and there are a lot of things out there um, for mitigation <laughs> for those resiliency and the disasters. Um, I, we saw buildings move electrical equipment from the basement up to above flood line. That's, that's one of the first things that happened. Elevators, uh, electrical equipment, all kinds of things. But we need to take the next step forward and see if we're reaching what the client's needs are as well. Do we move the doors of a building from one side to another side? Is a, is a building facing um, uh, oriented to the sun? Is it capturing heat and heat gain that is, uh, that is taking us into the night where it's at 3 a.m. it's just as hot as it is at 3 p.m.? So these are a lot of questions that we're asking on a regular basis now. And I want to go on to the next one. There's my button. Um, we're making incremental improvements as we go through each step of the way. And we're going to share this information in all different ways that we can um, 
with the client, with the design team, in order to improve our overall, communi our overall community within this field. Not only are we helping uh, teach the design team, but we are doing a lot to also teach all of our partners and working with all of our partners, whether our partner is um, a, a subconsultant, whether our partner is a service that we're using, whether it's our um, neighbors in the community, um, the communication is expanding. So I wanna go back to our list of our sustainability plan so that I didn't miss anything. Thank you. So the metrics are constantly changing as we're going through this. So if we're looking at a timeline of one to 75 years and we're, we're coming back after five years, we're finishing a project in five years of construction, then five years from then is actually 10 years from when we started the process. So if you think about it that way, has the, the um, impacts on the project changed? Um, is that timeline, do we know a little bit more along the timeline of that trajectory of climate change in that space of time? We do. We see how things are changing and we can adjust for it. Um, and that's, that's where we can go back and measure how our project has, has functioned in that time. Chances are at least one of the design conditions, one of the major storms that we've designed for has occurred because they're occurring more often than they used to. The 100 year storms um, are coming more frequently. We're expecting storms next week, I think. Or is it this week? Okay. So we're going to take that information and we're going to share that with the client and the client is going to update their resiliency guidelines, their standards to impact future projects going forward. So we're all working on the same timeline. And if we have more, um, when we have this pathway going forward, it allows everybody to be functioning on the same pathway. Okay, the alignment of the metrics with design and construction. So what I mean by that is that the contractor um, knows exactly what metrics they're meeting. And they know um, what they need to do in order to provide for it. Um, we don't want construction to ever be a, a roadblock and we don't want roadblocks to be in construction. So there's a lot of coordination between how the contractor goes forward with their, with their construction and um, looking and working with the design team. And as we get more information, um, more development in how the contractor is doing their business. We can encourage the contractor to consider all of these things. We can consider where the product, where they're going to use the lay down area. We can consider the pathway through the city. We can consider the um, emissions of, of their trucks and perhaps work towards having uh, lower emissions, perhaps having electric vehicles or some other technology that comes along. On regarding the uh, emissions of the, um, the construction vehicles, if we have them do a logistics check and run through the logistics of their pathway through the construction, we can have on-time delivery so they're not moving materials twice. They're, they have materials being delivered at the time 
that they're being assembled or within a reasonable amount of time of it. I think when I first started working in this field in construction, there was a lay down area on the other side of the facility room where we were building a garage. And all of the materials, I would go out to that site and check to make sure that the right sizes of steel were there, the right, uh, that the steel was the right length, that there was the right amount of precast. Um, but what happened was the contractor had everything delivered to one place and then they picked it up and brought it back across the other side of the facility in order to assemble it. So not only is it costing time because they're picking things twice, but they're also using more emissions, they're using more fuel, they're using more uh, more disruption to the neighborhoods where they're operating. And all of these things are the kind of things that we ask for within a sustainability plan. If we think about the whole picture of it, we can say we would like the contractor as much as possible to have on-time delivery for these major elements of their project. We want them to consider the logistics of the hauling routes and where they're going and the path they're taking through different neighborhoods. We want to consider the hours of the day that they're operating and create the baselines. And this goes with the design team as well. What is the baseline for noise? Uh, what is the baseline for existing conditions? And, and be able to um, make things better from that baseline. In order to be able to measure where we are with something. We need to have uh, a baseline. We need to have a benchmark of where we want to, what we want to achieve, whether it is 10% savings, 50% savings. We need to know what that existing baseline is before we can get there. Um, Massport at one time in one of their projects removed um, an enormous amount of buses from the facility just by consolidating um, the buses that went through the terminals um, into one bus system. It was a common sense kind of thing rather than have various different rental car companies with their own buses. They had one bus that everybody shared. Um, it was, the result was of something as common sense as that is that they saved the emissions for all the other buses that were running around the airport and the congestion and reduced um, and increased this traffic flow because of the reduced congestion. So looking at a big picture of something and creating your framework on those overarching goals, then as a res result, you achieve your goals and they all fit into the same plan. Now, we have a couple clients that refer to the sustainability resiliency plan as a living document, something that is going forward, um, something that is that they will make interim, uh, they'll update every five years, every six years, whatever it is appropriate for them. And then that document goes into the operation and maintenance. So they have a, um, a point person for sustainability within their facility that will um, track how much energy is used through, through a year, being able to look back. Uh, water, for example, um, if, an ex if the use of water is suddenly goes up, is there a leak in the system somewhere? Is, um, is something else happening in the system? Um, is there another use that's been added to the system that we don't know about? Um, all of these things get rolled up and it provides a pathway for the client um, to, to make as sustainable of a project as they can. I'm Marisa, gonna take questions there, uh, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I thought I would go and I'll start with uh, Jeff's question, do you have a sample of sustainability plan document? <laughs> I can share one. 
I, I think this is incredibly useful. Uh, first of all, much applause. You, you, this was so rich in information and it raises so many questions in my mind. Uh, but whatever you can share, we will try to post, if you're willing to have it posted on our Sustainability Education Committee, we'll post, all right? Whatever you can share. The questions that I, that came up in my mind were, were innumerable, uh, mainly because you point to the comprehensive thinking that is required and systems thinking that is required to make these all these ideas uh, work together in minutia as well as in big concept. And I, uh, in that connection, there are two questions that primary questions that come up. First of all. Are you the primes in most of these projects or are you uh, subcontractors to somebody else? Because this applies very much to the relationship of architects. Do you have architects in house? Do you have, uh, do you use uh, outside architects? Do you make your, your expertise known to architects? That's, that's one question. The second one is the, um, identifying perhaps in connection with the sustainability plan, the uh, an hierarchical organization in terms of timeline, one year, 10 years, 75 years, as well as in terms of scales. The scales that you uh, touched upon were the detail scales going down to the, the plumbing or water supply system of a, of a project to the overall scale of the project in a relationship to the neighborhood or the city. So uh, it, 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 you have it all in your head. We, we wish we <laughs> could do. be uh, a Dr. Head. Spock and get it, get it out of your head. But the main thing is somehow to help uh, by organizing, maybe this is sufficient by uh, having people look at the presentation that you uh, made already, but it will also help to answer Jeff's uh, question of the sustainability plan document and, uh, and, uh, and identifying the hierarchies that I just mentioned. So as far as the... Um whether we prime or not. Um, on the LaGuardia Airport, the architect was HOK. So they were priming the architecture. Um, we were the sustainability uh, infrastructure engineers. Um, and at the time the project started, there was no such thing at, at WSP. <laughs> what was that? Sustainability for infrastructure. Infrastructure is inherently sustainable in many ways because um, they right size it for durability. Um, it's usually made of local regional materials. Uh, it's uh, oftentimes um, infrastructure is by necessity right fitted for things. Um, so on that, we were sub to HOK for the sustainability part, but it wasn't, the relationship was that we were a team. So we worked together as a team. Yes, and, and that was very important to have the client and the, um, the people who would manage the, the facility all working together as a team was what made that project so successful. Uh, there's other projects, and, and I have to say that HOK was phenomenal in understanding sustainability. So they look to WSP for resiliency and for infrastructure, um, and, and they handled, um, but their understanding of sustainability was, yeah, was fabulous. Well, 
Well done. So, any other or uh, did I uh, trigger some other uh, answers? Yeah. So um, when you're a sub to an architect, I, I think getting the information out to architects is always important. And we, you know, we tend to work with the same architects over and over again. So you get to know each other, but getting the word out to other architects and saying, oh, but we do that too. You know, um, that's very important because when your head is down and you're working hard, you're not, you're not looking, um, you're not thinking of the next steps. So that's a reminder to all of us that we need to always communicate um, things with each other that, um, so, yeah, and I we do have our own in-house architects within WSP, but we mostly team with other architecture firms and work together. So we'll have an architect, uh, you know, that is working on the big concept of what they're looking, and then we'll have our architecture team working together with them for resiliency, for um, all of the little fine details of things that that are very important to, to customer satisfaction and, and a passenger experience. Um, so that's that question. Does that answer the first question? I think you're doing very well. How about some other questions from other participants? Well, you had a second question about- um, The hierarchization, the, the hierarchization uh, in terms of time frame. The time frame, and, yes. And the, the, the checking for performance uh, is really critical. How often do you get a contract that says, okay, we're gonna be on board with you for uh, the duration? This is really a new um, element of the design. I mean, it, we've had clients where we've had them for many years um, and we're constantly doing things that's one thing, but this future ready concept, um, there's one project I'm working on right now where our contract is every two years, we're, we're doing something along their timeline with them and that will continue. Um, and this is really a, a new concept that came about from future ready and from um, clients that basically said, we need to prepare for rising seas and storm surges, but we cannot financially do it right now. And we've always actually said, as far as resiliency goes, we've, we've said it for quite a few years that we can look forward to the next 10 years and then and the next set of years beyond that. Um, but to have a client come back and listen to us, I think it's, be, it's just beginning now to sink in that um, this is, a, this is an, a new way of looking at how to lay out their, their program, um, their capital program system. Fantastic. We do have well, another client. Um, well, listen, it wasn't a client for mine, for, for myself, but not only did they look at the um, resiliency side of thing, but they applied that timeline to sustainability. So they had in their mind, they bought a, um, an existing facility and they were, rather than build a new facility, they were going to retrofit an existing facility and the reach of their, of the client's vision expanded my vision because their vision was that um, not only were they going to retrofit and and reuse this existing building, which is an infrastructure element that they were not going, they were going to save all sorts of materials from by reusing that existing building, but they were also going to restore all of the land around that building. Uh, that that was going to include reforestation in, in one side of it, it was going to in, include restoring um, pasture land on the other side of it. And it was going to include 
um, adding gardens and food gardens and mm. different ways of managing, looking at the whole environmental system. Wow. Um, that went way beyond structural engineering. <laughs> wow. So there is a lot of thinking out there, a lot of things coming down the pike, a lot of possibilities that we need to open our minds to. Anybody else in the audience? Uh, yes, there are a few, a couple more questions in the uh, chat, on the chat. Esther, Esther, you need to talk more into the phone because you sound as if you were in a barrel. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so there are more, uh, a few more questions um, being um, posted on the chat. Uh, one of them is in general, what do you enjoy the most when working on delivering these projects and meeting their sustainable and ambition goals? And there's another question. Uh, what are the most frequent appearing roadblocks that appeared while working on the different stages of the, of the project? Okay, so the first one, what do I like best? Um, <clears throat> I like thinking about all the pieces because I, I'm one of those people who like to put together a puzzle. <laughs> and, and I like to um, see all of the pieces. So if we're in the design phase, I like to uh, see where all the people who are working on the project, what they do and how they can contribute and connecting them into the puzzle. Um, when, when we're working on the sustainability plan, I like to think as broadly as possible and gather as many people into that as possible so that we can all um, basically share information and allow all of these ideas to feed off of one another so that we can really have a cohesive design. So when we get a, um, there was one time I had left a client meeting in DC and the plane was late and I was sitting in the airport. This was a long time ago, <laughs> two years, I think. And I was sitting in the airport and I just had all of this, everything was fresh in my head. So I just started putting all the pieces together into an outline for the sustainability plan based on the communication from them. And so what I like to see is I like to see that whole outline to form that whole outline to create an umbrella for the entire project. So that's fun. And then your second question, Esther. What was that? Roadblocks. Roadblocks. Oh, roadblocks. Roadblocks are all over the place. There's the, the biggest one is when we specify a recycling program and then the doors are open and the contractor has not bought any recycling bins. <laughs> um, you know can, it's not a matter of pointing fingers at anybody because they're saying oh well we thought these were redundant barrels you know or whatever um roadblocks the biggest ones are the specifications client standard specifications are the biggest roadblock for concrete in particular concrete a lot of existing specifications are using a design that's 50 years old. Um, we, we need to think about how we specify materials. Are we, are we allowing, and I understand very thoroughly the importance of having good quality materials, good durable materials. Nobody wants to experiment on their pro project. Um, but we need to look at performance metrics for specs. So that's one thing. Specifications are a big roadblock that we run into all the time. And it could be from the federal level all the way down to the local level. The FAA all the way down to the local um, Boston Water and Sewer. Um, it, and um, so that's one. The other one for roadblocks is policy. And um, I have to give a lot of credit to some of the big clients we have, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, changing their policy in order to meet 
the sustainability requirements. Uh, kudos to them. Uh, Massport, they have done so much work to improve their sustainability and their passenger experience. Kudos to them. They have done a, a lot of really good things. So there are, there are um, clients out there that are recognizing their own roadblocks, but you know, we, we don't always know what those roadblocks are until we start the design process and someone says, oh, you can't do that because that's such and such. And I'll be like, why, this is better. Oh, but that's policy over there or that's what, the way they've always done it. You know, so uh, that we're always going to find the roadblocks during design, but as many of them, but if, if we can, if we identify them on one project, why would we apply that same roadblock on every other project going on for that client? We need to address the project, the, the, the project, the roadblock that that project is on, address it so that we can pave the way, make it easier for the rest of the projects. What Does about that answer my, the question? Yes. How Thank about you. microgrids? You mentioned microgrids. Can you give us some thoughts on that and the importance again of considering those uh, the, 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 the microgrids as a concept uh, at the design stage? Yes, yes. And I'm not an electrical engineer, let me just say that. Um, but one of the road, uh, one of the things that happens with resiliency is that um, when we have a project, say we have a, um, a, a bus facility, just because we're talking about expanding, Boston is talking about um, battery electric buses. Um, I think everybody knows that. And um, where do they get the electricity for those battery electric buses? So if, if there's a storm that knocks out the supply for those um, battery electric buses, then we need to have a backup system. And um, that backup system has traditionally been generators. So in, um, in a lot of facilities that we've worked on, we have for, for many years had uh, backup emergency um, generators for electricity and whatnot. That's not a new concept. So the, the microgrids is, um, is breaking apart those, is providing a service where a, a neighborhood could be all on the same grid. And, and I don't know all the ins and outs of what the requirements are for those um, because there seem to be policies in place where we have to buy electricity from certain entities. Yeah. <laughs> do you have do you have somebody in, uh, at WSP? I'm at sorry, WSP? I didn't quite get that. Do you have somebody at WSP who could uh, talk? Uh, yes. Yes, we have. Grids? Yes, and we have done microgrid grids on um, in other areas. I think we are doing them here in Boston, but with, but I'm not sure what the requirements how we're. Send, doing that, um, me, we have a number of projects that have done them. Send, send them uh, one or two uh, names to us, to this and me, and we'll try to, uh, to fill that into our uh, presentations. But uh, that brings up another question. You, um, I don't know whether this is too late uh, for, for this, uh, uh, this year's uh, 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 BSA uh, meeting, ABX used to be annually, I don't know where it is right now, but you might consider what uh, making your presentation, repeating your presentation, both to the AIA and to the A to ABX. Um, uh, if you- I'm sure we've passed the ABX deadline. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's right, that's right for this year. So are you for, for AIA. But um, it, it really, this needs to be heard. The way you are thinking comprehensively needs to be heard by architects, uh, no matter 
how they are involved in projects, either as primes, as sub, uh, subs to a, a big engineering firm, such as at an airport or whatever, uh, without architects, or a power station or uh, uh, the um, sewage treatment plant out of Deer Island which was primarily driven by engineers and only as an afterthought uh, did some architectural considerations come into play. I have a story about that facility. Um, so do tell. <laughs> <laughs> I was a very young engineer when that facility was um, being designed and built. We had a phenomenal water engineer that uh, he's long since retired. But you know how people put ideas into your head that you never forget. It, at, uh, so that facility pro produces 99% um, uh, pure water. And they send it in an outfall tunnel nine, nine, nine miles, miles yeah. out into the sea under the ocean floor nine miles under the ocean floor. And then there's ways that the water um, escapes the tunnel and goes into the ocean. And it has cleaned the ocean. So it's done a phenomenal job bringing the seals back, bringing um, uh, ocean life back to the Boston Harbor, cleaning so that you can see more than three feet ahead of you. I mean, when I first came to Boston, as a young engineer and we went scuba diving, honestly, we couldn't see three feet in front of us in the Boston Harbor. It was so dense with whatever was in there. Um, he said to me, if we had turned that tunnel from going out into the ocean to going back inland, nine miles, that volume of water, the tunnel is about 20 feet in diameter. I don't remember, 24 feet in diameter, big enough to drive two trucks through. If we had turned that back towards the Quabbin Reservoir, we would rejuvenate, we could rejuvenate all the streams and riverways that we used to have 100, 200 years ago. Wow. That concept was just outstanding. You know, um, he he knew what he was talking about, um, and he was thinking out of the box. But yeah. at the time, there was nobody who, there was no way that would happen back then. Yeah. But we are at a different time in, in our life now, in our communities, that we can think about things like that now that we couldn't think about before. So I, I encourage you. If I were to end on one thing, I would encourage you to think creatively on a, on a really big scale. Teresa, this year we're running towards the end of our meeting. I think you have been marvelous. I thank you very, very much. Uh, as I said, I'd like to go and make sure that uh, we, we get a chance to talk to others. But um, I have a million other questions. So at, uh, at one point or another, uh, maybe we can cross fertilize. Um, I have to make an announcement about uh, the, how people can get their IA credits. You go and look at the chat box and you'll copy and paste the, uh, uh, the information there. And in addition to that, uh, I, uh, we would like to announce, and I would like to announce that Blake Jackson will give, give a presentation on 921 about net zero. That's a concept that nobody has heard of, but you uh, might be interested in it on September 21st. In the meantime, a huge round of applause. For your Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day. I stopped.